So Andy Austin here, another metaphor analysis using metaphors of movement. Now this is a good one. Uh, Natalie sent this one in. It's like I'm untethered. I don't know which way is up. It's dark. I can't see anything. I'm not aware of any part of my body being in contact with anything else. No drawings needed for this one. Well, let's have a go. Let's see what we can do with this one. Now this is one of those um, very limited information. There's a funny thing about metaphors, experiential metaphors. There seems to be an inverse relationship between the amount of information they give in the metaphor and the information density. So when a person has a landscape that goes out and there's just there's things everywhere and there's stuff going on left, right, front, back, they give you lots and lots of data. Uh, quite often there's not much information um, density going on there. Um, sometimes you have like a desert and a cactus and that's it, that's all there is. The information density around that is, is enormous. And this is gonna be one of those, I think. Let's see what we can do with this one. So here we have a person who is now basically just floating around in something. Um, nothing is in contact with anything else. So they don't know where they stand. They don't have any understanding. They're not understood. And there we have the key bit detail. They are not understood. They're not understood by anyone or anything. This is a person who is in a world where they have no understanding whatsoever. Um, and that will be a big shock to that individual when you can actually say that to them. Um, so nobody, nobody understands you. You don't even understand yourself. In fact, there's nothing about you that's understandable. Nothing about you is understandable. Now there's a clue they have given within the, the thing. I'll just read it again. Uh, it's easy to miss. There are certain things that are very easy to miss. I pay attention as much to what the person doesn't say as to what they do say. Um, and when somebody denies something without actually being asked for that information, there's a little clue that can get given away. It's like I'm untethered. I don't know which way is up. It's dark. All right, so untethered. That's an unusual expression because essentially it would suggest that if they were tethered, this wouldn't be a problem. Now, let me draw you something that's tethered. Um, let's draw... Um, do you remember those zeppelins they used to have? Not zeppelins, the, the balloons, the, the barrage balloons, that was it. They used to fly them above cities, World War II era, um, basically to stop fighter jets coming low and bombers coming in low because they would basically crash into the, uh, the balloons or the cables, more importantly. It was a good way of uh, defending against aircraft. It was also an excellent way to advertise for the bombers where to actually drop the bombs. That was the other negative. So we can have balloons that are tethered. Now, because this person's effectively floating around, I don't know they're floating, I'm just saying that, I'm imposing that. They're floating around in, in something or nothing. Um, tethering them, it kind of makes me think of that. And and the other, the other thing that gets tethered, um, which hopefully you'll see immediately what this is, that is, of course, a cow. Um, and cows get tethered. And I suspect this person is neither a um, barrage balloon or a cow. However, tethering is kind of significant to them. So now we have identity stuff going on because now we have either the person is tethered or they're untethered in this situation. And if they're tethered, that would potentially be a partial container because it's a rope going around them. Um, it's unlikely to be going into them. Tethering doesn't normally imply sort of you get skewered with the attachment. And tethering, of course, is a form of attachment metaphor. So now this is a person who is unattached. They're so unattached, they're free-floating. They're a complete free spirit. Um, and they're just floating around, untethered, unattached. They're completely free. They're not even bound by gravity. This is all about freedom. So we start off with not much information. But by building on logical details and then adding more logic in, we start to get an expansion of the experience. So they're a free spirit. There's the identity statement right there. Um, they are looking or seeking or wishing for or wanting, I don't know what, I don't know what that would be, an attachment. They want to be attached to something. Now, those that have done the metaphors of movement training will know that attachment metaphors are not good. 
Attachment metaphors are very common, and they are typically about double bind structures, double bind relationship structures. So this is how people get into those absolutely insanely complicated relationships. Can't live with them, can't live without them, and everything's a double bind. Um, very common in narcissistic type relationships. It's very common in families, um, but parents to child, it happens in some workplaces, not just familial stuff. But these attachment metaphors in relationships are very rarely good um, because essentially they're a relationship that from which the person cannot escape. Um, we have voluntary relationships and involuntary relationships. My next door neighbor here, a voluntary relationship. I can cease contact and relationship with my neighbor simply by moving house because then I'm no longer that person's neighbor. A work colleague ceases to be my work colleague when I change departments or change jobs. Parents will be my parent even if I disown them. Brother will always be brother even if they're disowned. So we have voluntary and involuntary relationships. And what can be complicated is that when we form an involuntary relationship with a person who doesn't know they're getting into that. And this is this is daytime TV chat show territory, where you see these people in the most appalling relationships with another person. They may even have a child with the other person. They treat each other absolutely appallingly. They're having affairs left, right, and center, and there's all sorts of bizarre, horrible, backstabbing things going on, and still they stay together because they formed an inescapable bond at some level that doesn't seem to moderate their behaviors towards each other. They become... Some people get hooked on another individual, and it doesn't matter how many negative emotions come up, they can't break the bond with that person. I'm so lucky, I, that's never happened to me in my life, but I have known people over the years who have been in a relationship that was a disaster from the moment they were together. Um, they have broken up, but for some reason, the person can never let go of that attachment on that bond. It's still going on years, years later, even into new, stable, long-term relationships. They can never let that thing go. That's terrible. That's a terrible place to be. And I, I would say I can understand it, but I can't because I've never experienced it myself. Oh, that's who this person is. That is who this person would like to be. Essentially, they're floating about um, in nothing. They, they're on their own. They are completely alone. And as a result of that, they're untethered. Um, and only the company of another person can, will facilitate the tethering. Because what are they going to attach to? There's nothing there to attach to. It must be a person. So now this is a person who I would, in my single days, I'd run away from so fast. Um, I remember myself and Laura, we were out with friends um, back in the days where we were still social. And there was a friend of a friend who was in the pub and it was her first time out socially, I think in something like 10 years. And she was desperate for a man and made it very, very clear how desperate for a man that she was and announced it on just constantly to everybody. Um, and not only was she desperate for a man, it wasn't sort of a one night love affair she was looking for. She wanted someone to attach to instantly and be instant full-on relationship with. And I could just see that this was going to be terrible. There will be awful people who will take advantage of that. Um, she's an attractive lady. There will be people who will run away from that. And then there will be people who think, oh, that's what I'm looking for too. Oh my God, there's somebody else just like me. Bang! They're, they're now locked into something. They don't even know each other. The bonds have attached before all of their vulnerabilities and problems as a person could become as a complete package, have even been revealed to the other person. Um, it's a disaster waiting to happen. That's who this reminds me of. Uh, so this is a person who's looking for attachment quickly um, in order to save them from the abyss, to save them from a void. And when somebody's in the void and in the abyss and they, are, they have nothing, this person has nothing, then something will be attractive to them. It won't matter what it is, because something is better than nothing. I'm always reminded of that Billy Joel song, uh, The Piano Man. They're sharing a drink they call loneliness, but it's better than drinking alone. Gold. That's what's going on here. 
so now the question is, what do you do with this person? Um, essentially, we've got to get them grounded. We've got to get them back in reality. So I'm going to work with this person using the kind of stuff I've been saying here um, to make them aware of the gravity of the situation in which they find themselves. At the moment, see, they're not in a situation where there is no gravity. They're not in a situation where things won't bring them down. They can be brought down. Gravity will do that. They're, they're existing in a metaphorical reality where they're able to deny reality itself. You've seen people do this. They just laugh stuff off. They just, oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, don't worry about it. And that's how they cope with life. This is a very, very British thing, I think, as well. Um, other, other cultures will do this, but this is something we have very much in British culture, which is we get through stuff by denial. It used to be the stiff upper lip, you know, tighten the sphincters, stiff upper lip, lads, and just soldier on through. Um, it's changed over the years, and the colossal denial that I watch people doing of reality is amazing. This is the person who may well be the carefree, um, frivolous attitude. They may be overly light-hearted. Um, they're so light-hearted, they're defying gravity. Um, and by just laughing stuff off and brushing everything off, they're able to deny the gravity of the reality of their situation. So I'm going to be calibrating the behavior of the individual right in front of me, and how are they presenting themselves. So you might get this kind of suicidal depression reported on the form, they're on a boatload of drugs and all these other things going on, and you go, okay, this is a person with problems. And they arrive, and they're bright, and they're smiley, and they're laughing, and they're joking, and everything's ha 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 ha. They could be that person. So I'm going to calibrate for that. Or are they a person who has such a superficiality of consciousness that they just are never even going to penetrate the depths of their experience ever? They just want to um, stay within this, this ridiculous reality they've got for themselves. So this is an untenable position. As sooner or later, they're going to die. This is a form of immersion metaphor. There is no possibility of survival within this context. Um, they can carry on like this as much as they want to, but they're not necessarily going to do very well. The mistake will be to, to match them um, and laugh along with them and take it as a superficial thing. I would regard this as a life-threatening situation. I, I will bring a gravity to it, a gravitas to it, um, and I will happily bring them down. So when they laugh something off, I'll let them laugh and I'll say, I'm not laughing. I've got to tell you right now, I don't find that funny. You may well find that funny, but you've brought yourself here to give me some kind of responsibility to help you and you're laughing this off, and I don't find that acceptable behavior. I'll tell you that for a fact right now. Now, that is a very hard thing to do. If you're, if you're new as a therapist, if you're sort of still learning and, and gaining experience, the first 10 years are the hardest, that's going to be quite difficult to do, especially when you're m pacing your own state, and you need to be able to switch in and out to, at the right timings. Timing is everything with this. So you may not want to start there if, if, this is, <laughs> if you're new to this kind of work. So I think that's all I've got for this particular one. Um, it's a very information-dense one. This is it's largely about demeanor and denial of reality, um, the attachment issue that's revealed through the untethered um, is quite significant. And so I may want to look at their past relationships. What did they get attached to? Have they, have they ever been attached? What do they think of attachment? And so forth. And also, I will offer them potentially these two examples of things being tethered, just to see what do they mean by tethering, um, and how is that going to help them. If you have any additional thoughts, comments, observations on this, comment section below, below, comment section below. Um, hit the like button, it does help, it boosts, boosts me up the ratings. Um, comments help boost me up the ratings, as does that subscribe button. You know all the usual YouTube stuff, you know what to do.